shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment, your needs to stop. This evening, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 4. 1 Samuel, chapter 4 through 7, the Ark. We're talking about the Ark of the Covenant, the throne room of God here on earth at this time. We're talking about 3,000 years ago, about 1,000 years before Christ came to earth. And we're going to see in chapter 4 the capture of the ark because of sin. They lose the ark to the Philistines. We're going to see in chapter 5 the power of the ark. And in chapter 6, we're going to see the ark's return back to Israel. And then chapter 7, we're going to see the ark's restoration. And for those of you who have a, an outline here in the uh, sanctuary, we've got a little picture if I can remember, I'll try to put it up on screen for television and YouTube, but you'll see the picture of the ark. This was uh, in the back room of the tabernacle, and uh, it represented the throne room of God, as I said. On that mercy seat, they would sprinkle the blood of the animal on that mercy seat on the Day of Atonement, and that was to be covering the sins for one year. John tells us that Jesus is our mercy seat propitiation, satisfaction. And so he represents the uh, sacrifice, he represents the satisfaction of it. There are two cherubim on this little box looking down on the, uh, on the box. There are poles, very important to notice those poles. They couldn't touch the ark, they had to carry it on their shoulders. And as we get into the study, we'll talk about the ark a little bit more. And inside the ark, you're going to see the little uh, tables of stone. See how small they are in that picture. Uh, not as big as Charlton Heston had in the Grand Ten Commandments movie, but just small little stones. And um, then we see the uh, rod of Aaron, which budded to show that Aaron's household was the true priestly household, and a little pot of manna as well, representing the manna that came to them through the wilderness over 40 years, all of which speaks to Jesus Christ, who is our manna, he is our bread, he is the sacrifice, he is the one who fulfills the law, he is the chosen one as the Messiah. And so with that in mind, as always, and may I say for all of us, never, ever open the Bible and try to read God's word without asking for his help. We need to have the help of God, don't we? So Father, we ask right now, <coughs> excuse me, that we're going to understand your word, enlighten us, Lord. Give us new insight and wisdom and application for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to go back to Exodus for a moment, <clears throat> chapter 25. And in Exodus 25, we have the uh, words of God to Moses about this little box, this little throne of God. And uh, Exodus 25, verse 10. <clears throat> They shall make an ark of acacia wood. God had, was very wise. He, he chose a wood that was very lightweight, that was resistant to insects in the desert, uh, also in, resistant to moisture. And uh, God is practical, isn't he? Uh, acacia wood, it's gonna be two and a half cubits in length, very small. That's a cubit is 18 inches, so two and a half cubits, do the math, that's 45 inches. Just 45 inches long. And it's going to be a cubit and a half high. That's 27 inches high and 27 inches wide. You're going to overlay it with pure gold inside, and you'll uh, oh, inside, and also you'll make on it a molding of gold all around. So inside and out, it's got gold, and uh, there's molding all around for decoration. Uh, you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in the four corners. Two rings on one side, two rings on the other, and you'll make poles, again, acacia wood, and overlay them with gold. So it's lightweight, 
and they cannot touch that ark. They have to carry it on the poles, on their shoulders. You put the poles in the rings, and the ark's going to be carried by them. Notice that God is not leaving anything to question. He doesn't want you confused. If you can't get the instructions from God on something, ask him. Wisdom, Lord. I use that prayer every day, all day. Whether I'm working on the computer or I'm working on the toilets and cleaning them or what have you and having a problem, wisdom, Lord. And he'll give you the details that you need. He doesn't want us to be wondering and worrying. Well, you're going to put the, uh, the poles in there, verse 16. You'll put the, uh, the testimony. That would be the two tables of stone for the Ten Commandments. You'll have a mercy seat of pure gold on top of it, the same circumference uh, as the box. You'll make two cherubim of gold, representing those angelic beings in heaven, looking down on that uh, mercy seat. And uh, he says they're going to stretch out their wings, verse 20. They'll be facing each other. And uh, here, verse 22, And there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. So he's going to meet them at that mercy seat when the high priest goes behind that curtain into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and sprinkles the blood of the animal, as I said, and the sins will be forgiven, or at least covered, hopefully, for one more year until Christ comes and eventually removes those sins through his sacrifice. So that's the background. And uh, we're going to see how far Israel has fallen. Uh, this is about... Oh, Moses had gotten that word around almost 1,500 years before Christ. This is about 500 years later. And uh, now they're uh, kind of taking the ark lightly because of sin. The throne room of God here on earth in symbolic form. Jesus became the throne of God, the tabernacle. Uh, John tells us in John chapter 1, verse 1, that in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, verse 14. The Word became flesh and tabernacled, or dwelt, among us. And we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father. So Jesus became the tabernacle of God when he walked here on earth. After he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit began to indwell believers. Maybe they manifested speaking in tongues. The power of God began to move on them through miracles and healings. We became and become the tabernacle of God. So where is the tabernacle today? Where is the ark? You're looking at it. I'm looking at it. We individually and corporately are the tabernacle of God. Let's act accordingly. All right, let's get into our text tonight. First Samuel chapter 4. The Philistines are going to capture the ark in battle, and they're going to kill Eli's sons. We saw last week that Eli's sons were wicked, weren't they? Eli was the high priest, descended from Aaron, the proper order, but the sons were wicked. They were not really saved. They were the sons of Belial, or Satan. They were actually copulating with women right at the door of the sanctuary of the tabernacle of God, having sex right there at the altar. And uh, they were just choosing the best meats of the sacrifice. They would grab the best uh, cuts of meat for themselves, making people despise bringing animal sacrifices to God. People despise working for God when they see the leaders who are skimming money and uh, abusing power. It turns people off. And that's one of, the, one of the reasons why we don't want to sin. We don't want to turn people off to Jesus, don't want to displease the Lord, don't want to be punished. So uh, these guys were wicked, and the prophet came, and God also spoke to uh, Samuel to confirm it, that Eli's sons are going to die, and nobody in Eli's family is going to reach old age, because Eli was also sinning by permitting his sons to act in this way. Parents have a responsibility uh, to train up their children as best they can. Now, kids can still have good training and go bad. God has to sort that out as to what's the fault of the kids and the parents. But the parents, do the best you can with your kids. All right, let's see what happens now in chapter 4, verse 1 of 1 Samuel. The word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped at Aphek. The Philistines were Gentiles. They... Uh, had five major cities, and they were by the Mediterranean, near what is today Tel Aviv in that area. And uh, they were always an enemy of, uh, of Israel. And they're an enemy at this time 
of Israel. So the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. Can you imagine that? That was a bad day. How did you do today, honey? Well, we lost 4,000 people. Oy, oy, oy. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us, that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So this is the headquarters of the tabernacle at that time. It's Shiloh, centrally located in Israel, later to be moved to Jerusalem with King David. But now it's in Shiloh. And so we've had a terrible day, and we want to bring the Ark, which is the presence of God, uh, in our midst. And so they're looking for this tangible, physical representation of God to change things. Now, God wanted them to respect this little box. It represented God, but it wasn't God. And so their attitude basically is, you know, we're, we're, I'm having trouble. I'm out there sinning. I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing, but I, I need to carry a cross. Uh, or I need to keep the Bible in my pocket. Uh, and that's not the answer. The cross and the Bible should be speaking to us of what the Lord says. Repent. That's what's going to bring God's attention. Repent. Change. But the physical box isn't going to do any good, and, the, and the, the cross won't do any good, and the Bible won't do any good unless we change our hearts and turn from our sins. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. So they are not getting the idea. It's not the box that's going to save them. It's repentance, turning to God, and obedience that's going to do it. But they don't know that. All right, so now we have the two sons of the high priest, Eli, has Hophni and Phinehas. They bring the ark. Verse 5, when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. So they're excited about the physical box. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? You see, they don't believe in one God, they have many, many gods there in the Philistine cities. These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. So it was the one God who struck Egypt with the plagues, but not God's plural. So the Philistines are confused. They're scared. They think that this box is going to have great power and might change the whole outcome. But again, God was saying that the box represents me, and I want you to be obedient to me and not just worry about the physical box. So be strong, is what the Philistines are saying. Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. Remember, at this time, the Jews, the Hebrews, are servants of the Philistines. What's that mean? That means they can't do anything without permission. They can't make any iron. They can't make iron implements. They can't do anything without permission. They are totally occupied even as in Jesus' time, Rome was totally occupying uh, Israel. Tough, tough to be occupied by uh, a foreign power. Well, the Philistines fought, verse 10. Again, Israel was defeated, and every man fled to his tent. There was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Wow, verse 2, we lost 4,000, now we got 30,000 more. And, notice this, the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. So just because you have the ark of the covenant doesn't mean that you're going to have the victory. I'm out there sinning, but I go to church. Therefore, I am like Teflon, and nobody can lay a hand on me. I can sin and do all that I want, but I tithe and I'm protected. I sin and do what I want, but I pray. And I take people to church and I bake pies and mow lawns for people. No, 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 no. 
All of this has to be predicated on the fact that we are repenting of our sins, we are turning from them, and we're living for the Lord. Then these blessings will flow. Then the rewards come from these good acts for the Lord. But they're not a replacement or a substitute for repentance. And so much of the world does that. Uh, they, they have their rituals and their rites, and they ring their doorbells on Saturday, and they light their candles, and they uh, take their trips to Mecca and Medina, and et cetera, et cetera. It's going to make it all better. No. We've got to repent of our sins and turn to the Lord. That's the key to having blessings from God. Well, now the two sons of Eli are dead. So a man of Benjamin, verse 12, he ran from the battle line the same day, came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, what does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man quickly came and he told Eli. Eli was 98 years old and his eyes were so dim that he couldn't see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, what happened, my son? So the messenger answered and he said, Israel has fled before the Philistines and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. Then it happened, when he made mention of the ark of God, Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate, his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was old and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. So that's the end of this man. He's a good man and a godly man. His only sin was allowing his sons to lead reprobate lives. But God held him responsible because of the fact that he had not reined his sons in and done the best he could to bring them before the Lord. And again, he was in a tabernacle about the size of this room. And for the boys to be fooling around with the girls right there at the doorway, even if he was dim with eyesight, he had to have some sense of what he was doing. He did correct them, but it was kind of like, oh, you shouldn't do that. And uh, it's, it's not easy raising kids that aren't going to walk with the Lord, but um, in any event, he cared for the boys, but he particularly cared for the ark of God. And he fell backwards, he died, and that was it. Well, another tragedy, his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have borne a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured, and because her father-in-law and her husband had died. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God has been captured. So the name Ichabod has gone on to uh, have a rather bad connotation. It really means the glory has departed. So you name your grandkids what you want or kids what you want, but uh, for my, my advice would be don't, don't name them Ichabod because we want to we see, uh, see God's glory present, not departed. So there's chapter 1, the ark is captured. Uh, the lesson I have here in the outline, <clears throat> excuse me, sin causes God's glory to depart, but repentance causes it to return. Sin causes God's glory to depart. They were sinning, and the glory of God left them. The power of the ark, the presence of God had left them, and uh, they hadn't gotten the idea yet that only repentance is going to cause the glory of God to return. Well, let's see what the power of uh, the ark can do now in the hands of the Philistines. See how powerful that is. Chapter 5. <clears throat> the Philistines take the captured ark to Ashdod, one of their cities, and uh, <clears throat> they set it up in the, in the temple to Dagon. Dagon's one of their gods. And there's a statue to Dagon, and uh, Dagon's statue is going to fall twice before the ark. And the people are struck with tumors. And the ark is going to be sent to Gath and then to Ekron, to other cities, and with the same results. We're going to see in this little chapter that God's power is greater than anyone or anything. Chapter 5. 
Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to Ebenezer, or from Ebenezer to Ashdod. That's one of the cities. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. That was their Philistine idol. So there's this Philistine idol, and here's the little box, the Ark of the Covenant. And when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the Ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set it in its place again. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the ground before the Ark of the Lord. The head of Dagon and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any who came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. So we see here in symbolic form the power of God over the so-called gods of our own making. Dagon is not a god, but they had made a statue to this Dagon. But God is real. And we see this played out in our lives as well. We come to God if we're not coming to the Lord in infancy. We come to the Lord after we've had a little bit of mileage on us. We've been around in the world for a while, and we've picked up some sins and scars, kind of like cattle roaming around uh, and the yard and the fences and the twigs, we get some scars here and there. We pick up addictions. We pick up uh, bad traits of character and attitudes. We, uh, we pick up things that uh, seem very good to us and subtle, but they're really of their, their gods. Uh, I want to make my, my work my god, my power. I want to make ministry my god. You know, that can be an idol. God talked to me more than once about that. I said to the Lord jokingly, I haven't got time for you because I'm too busy working for you. And he said, that's because you're making ministry, not me, you're God. So make sure that we put our God next to these idols and see our idols fall. Everything needs to fall. That's a common thing for pastors. Sometimes they take sabbaticals. Sometimes they, they leave the ministry altogether. Hopefully not, but sometimes they do. Uh, but make sure that nothing, even ministry, takes the place of God. Lord, is there a day gone in my life? <clears throat> is there something in my life which uh, is before you? How about the number one day gone, the God of self? I did it my way. How about that? The God of self. Make sure that the God of self is not alongside of Almighty God. Because what's going to happen is, if you put the God of self next to the God of of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God of self is going to fall. The head's going to fall off. The palms are going to fall off. You're going to lose whatever it is. It could be that job you're going to lose. It could be your health. It could be something else. So when you put something else, especially self, next to God and make it in competition with it, it'll always fall. Only God can always win. So Lord, if there's a day God in my life, help me to put it to death and put you on the throne of my heart. Well, verse 6 now, the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. So God's going to deal with them now because uh, they have no right, really, to handle that ark without being believers. There are those who try to minister the things of God without knowing him. I've, I've known a, a few ministers who have devoted their lives to the congregation and to the service of God without any knowledge of or interest in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Handling the things of God without knowing God can be very dangerous. Lord, I want to know you. And that goes for those of us who've received Jesus Christ but have not received the fullness of Christ, have not received all that he wants to do. I believe that Jesus Christ can save me from my sins, but I don't believe he can heal my sicknesses. Oh, don't go there because that's a dangerous place to be. Maybe you don't believe that yourself, but say, Lord, I, I'm here to learn. I know people who believe that Jesus Christ can heal sickness and disease. I don't believe it, but I want you to change my heart and help me to be a believer. And so uh, there are those, many, I've, we lost a, a good part of our congregation because we believe in healing, healing in the atonement. Many Christians don't. I dare say most Christians do not believe that Jesus died for our sicknesses as well as our sins. Be careful with that because that's minimizing God. But as I'm pointing fingers at them, fingers come back at me. Am I minimizing God? 
Am I saying, God, you can't meet all my needs? How big is my God? Lord, may I have a bigger picture of who you really are. So if there's a, if there's a day God in my life, uh, a tumor in my life, Lord, heal me of it. Well, he says here, the, the men of Ashdod, verse 7, saw how it was, and they said, the ark of the, of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. <laughs> we don't want that ark around here. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. When I got born again, I just went whole hog for the Lord. I was 35 years of age, and I just went crazy for the Lord, morning, noon, and night, reading scripture, loving him, going to church every time the doors were open. I got so excited, I called everybody I knew in my family, from Maine right over to California, down to Tennessee, and said I got born again. I made a phone call to my birth father, who was an elder in the Presbyterian Church in Knoxville, Tennessee. And I said to him, I'd only seen him three times in my life, but I called him up and I said, I've become born again and given my heart to Jesus Christ. And here's this elder of the Presbyterian Church, born uh, into a Christian family, had a Bible by his bedside. They said he knew the Bible better than anybody in that whole area, comparing himself with, with pastors. He said, now son, you be careful about that religion. Too much of that can be really harmful to you. And I said, well now, Jerome, I'll tell you something. It's time for you to get the Holy Spirit. And he said, uh, I don't know much about the Holy Spirit. I said, you don't speak in tongues? He said, no, I don't. I said, then it's time that you do. So he said, okay. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. This is all by telephone. I'm in Albany. He's in Knoxville. We prayed. <clears throat> At the end of that, I said, now you speak forth in tongues in the name of Jesus. And he began to speak in tongues. So that the rest of his life, he spent more time with the Lord than he had beforehand. So if you're one of those folks who says, I don't want this around me, it can be dangerous having too much Jesus. No, it does nothing but heal you and help you every single step of the way. So they want to get rid of this God because they don't want to accept this God. Uh, if you want to get away from God, don't do that, my friend. Embrace him. Verse 8, Therefore they sent and gathered to themselves all the lords of the Philistines, and they said, What shall we do with the ark of God? And they answered, let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath. So let's give it to somebody else. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away. And so it was, after they had carried it away, that the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. He struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And so it was, as the ark of God came to Ekron, guess what? They have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, and they said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it be go back to its own place so that it does not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. And the men who did not die were stricken with the tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. So... God cannot be handled by the unbeliever. And yet so many times in so many congregations and so many households, the unbeliever is trying to pretend to be handling God. Now, we're all in a journey. We're all in a searching process. There's a time in our lives we're reading the Bible and don't know the Lord. I don't discourage you. Keep reading. Ask for insight. Ask for a change of heart. But when we're pretending we've got it all, we're pretending that we know God. Like that Presbyterian church up here that I went to, where the pastor invited me to speak to his congregation. And he told me that he believed that salvation was being a member of that church and doing good works in the name of that church. And I said, I believe it's a personal decision of receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior washed in his blood. And he and the congregation I spoke to violently opposed that. And so they were, they were handling God's word without really knowing him. Well, the good news was I told this, I think, last week. Eventually, about 25, 30 years later, he did receive the Lord. He'd been in ministry for over 40 years, but he finally did receive the Lord. It's never too late. It's a relationship with him. Don't just handle the things of God. Don't handle the Bible and the things of God pretending you have it all. But say, Lord, I need to know you, and I need to repent of my sins. So there's the power of the, uh, of the ark. God's power is greater than anyone or anything. All right, chapter 6. We've got to get that ark back home, don't we? 
Here the Philistines are going to return the ark to Beth Shemesh. And the Israelites who look into that ark are going to be struck dead because you don't touch the ark. He taught them that back in Exodus. Believing Israelites actually suffer more severe consequences, including death, than the unbelieving Philistines who received the tumors because they disrespected God's ark. You know, the punishment can be greater for believers than for unbelievers because, quote, for everyone to whom much is given, much will be required. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. So let's look at chapter 6 now. Now the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it to its place. They wanted to get rid of it. So they said, If you send away the ark of God of Israel, do not send it empty, but by all means return it to him with a trespass offering. Then you'll be healed, and it'll be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. The belief was then that the God's going to require something. You've got to make some gift to God. Some gift to God. It's amazing how so many Christians don't give anything to God. Born-again Christians don't bring any money into the congregations uh, in this country. They don't, they don't give tithes or offerings. And the unbelievers realize that even with their false gods, you've got to bring something to them. And so here they're, they're thinking, you've got to give this God something. So they're going to devise a gift here. So they said, what is the trespass offering, verse 4, which we shall return to him? So they said, let's give him five golden tumors and five golden rats, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. There are five major cities. For the same plague was on all of you, on your lords. So they want to give this god of the box golden tumors and, uh, and rats, so to speak, so that they'll take away this plague so, and uh, to appease it. So make these images, verse 5, um, uh, that, that, uh, in order to lighten his hand from you, from your gods and your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? So they have learned something from Egypt. We've got to give this God something. Now therefore, verse 7, make a new cart, take two milk cows, which never have been yoked, and hitch the cows to the cart, and take their calves home away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord and set it on the cart, and put the articles of gold which you are returning to him as a trespass offering in a chest by its side. Then send it away and let it go. And watch. If it goes up the road to its own territory, to Beth Shemesh, then he has done uh, us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It happened to us by chance. So they're not 100% certain that it was the God of Israel who was bringing about these tumors and and the rats and all, but we've got to find out. So let's have a test. Let's take the ark, put it on a cart, let's get two milk cows and their calves. Now that means these two milk cows are nursing their calves, and the natural instinct of the mother is to stay with the calves. So they're going to hold the calves back and see if the mothers on their own will leave their young and go down the road, cross the border into the territory of Israel in Beth Shemesh. That would be unnatural for them to do that. But if that's the case, and they go back to Israel, then it was the God of Israel who was punishing us, and we want that ark out of here, back into his hands. So now they're going to watch this test and see what happens. Verse 10, Then the men did so. They took two milk cows and hitched them to the cart, shut up their calves at home, and they separated them, and they set the ark of the Lord on the cart, the chest with the gold rats and the images of their tumors, and the cows headed straight for the road to Beth Shemesh, and went along the highway, lowing as they went, and did not turn aside to the right hand or the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. Now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted their eyes and saw the ark, and they rejoiced to see it. What joy that the ark is back. Then the cart came into the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh and stood there. A large stone was there. So they split the wood of the cart, offered the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord, as a sacrifice, picturing the future death of Jesus Christ for our sins. The Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the chest that was with it, in which were the articles of gold, and put them on the large stone. So the Levites would know how to handle the ark. 
The Levites were responsible for carrying it. And so they would know to use the poles, don't touch the ark. Then the men of Beth Shemesh offered burnt offerings, made sacrifices the same day to the Lord. They rejoiced. So when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. They were glad to get rid of those, uh, they, they, those problems with that ark. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned as a trespass offering to the Lord, one for Ashdod, one for Gaza, one for Ashkelon, one for Gath, and one for Ekron, each of the five cities. The golden rats, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both fortified cities and country villages, even as far as the stone of Abel, on which they set the ark of the Lord, which stone remains to this day, right there in the field of Joshua at Beth Shemesh. So he struck the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. He struck uh, 50,070 men of the people, and the people lamented because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. You probably have a note in your margin if you have one. That's probably a little misprint. The scribe, if the scribe made a little tiny mark, like an apostrophe, it would throw that number off. He probably only struck 70 which is, again, a lot, 70 men of the people and 50 oxen uh, of a man. But um, in any event, there was a loss because they should not have touched the ark. They should have known that. They looked inside. Uh, that's a good lesson for us. Learn how to handle God and the things of God. Don't presume and don't uh, uh, go ahead and do things we shouldn't be doing. Well, the men of Beth Shemesh said, who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? Now they're upset with God because he struck them for touching the ark. To whom shall it go up from us? So how do we get rid of this ark now? So they sent messengers to the inhabitants of Kirjath Jerim, saying, the Philistines have brought back the ark of the Lord. Come down and take it up with you. So nobody wants this hot potato, this ark, too hot to handle. And so it is with so many people today. Be careful, son, how about that religion? You can just have too much of it. And that's an attitude that so many have. You know, I don't want to get involved in that. I can't live a perfect life. And if I'm less than perfect, God's going to smite me down. No, that's not true. But uh, people find sometimes that Jesus is too much to handle. And so we want to make sure that we don't have that attitude. Chapter 7, finally, the Ark's restoration. It's finally moved now to kirjath Jerim, and it's going to remain there for 100 years. And after 20 years, Samuel is going to call Israel to uh, put away its gods and return to the Lord, and Israel is going to repent under the leadership of Samuel. The Philistines are going to attack Israel again, but now they're going to be soundly defeated, and they're going to relinquish all of Israel's captured cities. They're going to return all of them back there. Uh, the lesson, I think, for chapter 7 is righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach or a disgrace to any people. Chapter 7, then the men of kirjath Jerim came, and they took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab of the hill, round the hill, and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. I wonder how they felt about the ark coming into their house. Excited, this is the presence of God here on earth, but also it's got a pretty bad history recently, not only among the Philistines, but all those folks that died there in the... In the uh, Kirjath Jerim. So um, we're a little bit nervous. Let's make sure we know how to handle this properly. So the men of Kirjath Jerim came and they, uh, they put it into the house now of Abinadab. And so it was that the ark remained in Kirjath Jerim a long time. It was there 20 years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel has the right idea. It's about repentance. Not so much about the box, but it's about repenting to the God of the box, the, the Ark of the Covenant, if you will. And so that box will remain there for a hundred years, and King David is going to want to have it brought to Jerusalem and make that the center of worship. But as they put that box on another cart, 100 years later, that cart's going along and the oxen will stumble over the road, over a stone. The cart begins to 
shake a little bit and the ark begins to fall to the ground and one of the attendants who should have known better reaches out to touch the ark to keep it from falling and breaking on the ground and he is struck dead by God immediately. So David gets all upset and he leaves it in that house and has to figure out uh, how to get it there and finally he reads the word of God on how it's to be done properly and then takes it to the city just like us. We, we tend to rush in and try to do the work of God without knowing how God wants to do it. And then you fail and then you have to start all over again. Well, you know, I don't want to ask God what to do about this church for growth because I'll tell you, there are a lot of hot things on the internet about how to grow a church. And so the church down the street is making all sorts of moves. They got all sorts of gimmicks and programs and wonderful things and happening there. Let's just go ahead and do that. That's easier than praying and waiting on God to give us direction. And so we go ahead and we follow somebody else's idea. I once knew a pastor, one of my early churches, who had the, uh, the, the desire to follow any hot church in the country. Whatever they were doing, he was going to do. And he was looking to see who was hot and who was not. And if they were hot, he was following it. He never went to God to get God's direction. And his end was not a happy one. I'll leave I'll leave it at that. In any event, um, here's what Samuel says. You've got to repent. Return to the Lord with all your hearts. Put away the foreign gods. Put away the Ashtoreths. Those, those are the female uh, fertility goddesses. Prepare your hearts for the Lord. Serve him only. He'll deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. It's about repentance. It's about service. So the children of Israel put away the Baals. Those are the male gods. And the Ashtoreths, the female gods. They served the Lord only. And Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mitzvah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mitzvah, drew water, poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. That's what God wants to hear. I have sinned. Don't shift the blame to somebody else. Jesus didn't die for blame shifters. He died for sinners. It's not my fault in this relationship. I've done everything right in my family. It's everybody else against me. Everybody else at my job or my, my church. I am without sin, but they're doing me wrong. God, change them. God doesn't hear that prayer. Lord, I have sinned. Change me. That's the sin, the, the prayer that God's going to hear. Verse 7, the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mitzpah. The lords of the Philistines went up against Israel, and the children of Israel heard it, and they were afraid of the Philistines. You know, they were afraid because they had never defeated them in recent memory. The children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb, offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mitzpah, pursued the Philistines, drove them back as far as below beth -car. Samuel took a stone, set it up between Mitzpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. And so Ebenezer there means the stone of help. The Philistines were subdued. They did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath, and Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mitzpah, and judged Israel in all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. One of the earlier judges, Samson, had quite a victory over the Philistines on several occasions, including at the end, you recall, how he grabbed the pillars and pushed them, and, and thousands of the Philistines had died. But Samson was pretty much about Samson. He was all about uh, his emotions, and uh, never saw himself really as a leader of Israel the way Samuel did. 
he was always acting on his own. He was a, was a hot shot. He'd be like a basketball player today that wants to take all the shots instead of being a team player. And so he killed some Philistines, but Samuel did much more by leading them in prayer. And I want to close with this prayer once again. It, uh, as they uh, were, were gathering before them, they, they said, we've sinned. And uh, he had told them that they need to repent. They need to turn. Look at verse 3 one more time in verse 7. If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put the foreign gods away and the asterisk from among you. Prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel had the answer. He didn't have the box. The box was over at uh, Abiram's place, but he had the repentance. He understood he had a personal relationship with God, and God used him mightily. So for all of us, if we're looking for some kind of special something, I've got to touch a physical cross, I've got to have oil. Now these things can be good, but if I'm relying on the oil or relying on the cross or relying on prayer or the book or whatever, church attendance, being a good guy, that's not going to get us to heaven. What's going to get us to heaven is repentance. I have sinned. I have sinned, Lord God, forgive me. And I invite Jesus Christ into my heart. Lord, you have died for my sins. You've become my sacrifice. And you've died also for my sicknesses and my poverty and all that concerns me. So I'm going to lead you all in a sinner's prayer. And if you're watching by television or by YouTube, if you're in another country, we now reach over 160 countries uh, that have responded to us, uh, give your heart to Christ. And if you don't know him, you've been raised as a Buddhist or as, as a Hindu or as a Muslim, I'm not going to ask you to receive Christ because you don't know what you're doing. But you're going to say this, Jesus, I have heard that you are the Savior. Prove it to me with my background, my religion, my ethnicity, where my family. Show me who you are and allow me to receive you by faith. He will speak to you individually. He'll give you your own way of receiving him. Could be through radio, television, this YouTube program, through a Bible, even a dream. But he'll speak to you right where you live. I've seen folks come to Christ when they call out to him that way. I was one who had never believed that Jesus Christ was God. But I asked him to prove it to me, and he showed me right in his word. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for the lessons we've learned tonight, basically centering around repentance. Sin causes us, Lord, to see the glory of God depart from our lives but repentance is coming back to you is going to cause that glory to return. We repent, Lord. We're all sinners. We've all come short of the glory of God. Lord Jesus, we believe you died for our sins. You rose again for our justification, our righteousness. Come into our hearts, Lord. Live your life in us. We will live for you. We're not going to trust in tangible things, talismans of this or that sort. But Lord, we're going to be trusting in you and a personal, powerful relationship with you. And Holy Spirit, come in our hearts if we know the Lord but have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Lord, bring that upon the listener as well. Lord, we want to just trust in you now as our power to go forth and share the good news of salvation in and through and only through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Moment your needs to some.